We've all heard the term big data, how information from our phones and computers and elsewhere can be used to tell us what route to take, help companies sell more things to us, and address big problems from transport to natural disasters. You won't be surprised to learn that Singapore is a leader in using big data. So when the Asian Institute of Management decided to create a data science program, it hired some of the top Filipinos from Singapore's Agency for Science, Tech, and Research. The first of them is already here, Erika Legara, together this morning with AM President and Dean Jikyong Kang. Jikyong, Erika, thank you very much for welcoming us to AAM. Thank you thank very you much for coming to see us. Let's start with how you got to data science. When AAM was founded in 1968, it was a pioneering business school in the region. Over the past at least couple of decades, because schools in other countries are supported by faster growing economies, more supported and stronger companies, AM has lost some of its edge. What's it been like? And you've been here two and a half years. What's it been like competing in that kind of an environment? Obviously, it is an incredibly competitive market, uh, the MBA and the business school market as a whole. And I don't think you can actually put everything on AIM, to be honest with you. When AIM was established in 1968, 49 years ago, Philippine was the idol of Asia. I remember growing up in Korea, we worshipped Philippines. We wanted to be like the Philippines. So the fact that Philippines has gone through some tough times, um, including those eras of martial law and so on and so forth, has a lot to do with uh, some of the things that are happening in, in, in this particular space. Because unlike um, when you're studying history, uh, psychology and whatnot, you know, people go to business school, management school with uh, quite possibly a hope that they will find an employment opportunity in their country. So there is a huge relationship between country factor and the attractiveness of the management school. And, and unlike it, studying history of, or one of those subjects, when you go to business school, you're always looking for the latest thing. Absolutely, <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. I mean, the fact that you now have a top uh, world-class business schools in China, uh, India, Korea, Japan. It, it, it all has to do with the sort of hand in hand the fact between you know where people want to go to business school and what's happening to their country. Where the strong and innovative companies Absolutely. are. Absolutely. That all feeds on each other. Exactly. It's an so, ecosystem. So what's it been like, and you've been here two and a half years, what's it been like competing in that kind of environment? It is tough for AIM, there's no doubt about it. We don't um, we, we purely rely on our own revenue, mostly from tuitions and uh, short program revenues. We do not get any funding from government or there is no big funding agencies. Um, and, and Philippines is no longer Philippines that used to be. However, the fact that the economy is very strong, we're growing six plus percentages for the last few years and, and there is a projection for the um, several uh, years coming up and that that does help what have you tried to do and how did you get to data science right um, our MBA program is a uh, deflection program there's no doubt about it and we will continue to invest in our flagship program but at the same time the world has changed so much uh, we no longer operate in the eras where the traditional MBA program was invented so I have been looking with our colleagues what could be some of the innovations, <coughs> innovative programs we could introduce to uh, the market. And uh, as, as you know, we launched the Master of Science in Innovation and Business. Uh, this year was the first year we launched it. And earlier this year, Dado and I were sitting down and, and you know, he has, Dado been, yes, he has been inspiration for us, a big supporter, a big friend of AIM. And he mentioned to me out of blue in a way that we should start a data science program and my first reaction was why AIM you know maybe we can do business analytics but you know I don't know much about data science I always thought that was some um, geeky <laughs> computer science <laughs> folks um, you know engineering folks 
And when he explained to me that you guys are in a perfect position to offer this program because for anybody to become a real good data scientist, they got to know what questions to ask first. You know, they need to understand the market situation, the environment. Without that, being able to provide a technical solution will be meaningless. And from there, I started looking for data scientists. And you eventually found um, some Filipinos in a Singapore agency, and Erica is, has, is the first to join so far. Erica, could you tell us, in a nutshell, what is big data? Um, I, as what Dikion said, the world has changed a lot, and one of these things is because of the amount of data that the world has been you know, generating. And yeah, we don't normally use <laughs> big data because um, the term. Yeah, the term is quite arbitrary. Like if you ask a statistician or a clerk, if you give him a file that's more than an that more than that would fit an Excel file, that's already big data for them. But if you talk to Google, that would be. <laughs> petabytes of data. So what we want to call it is data science. Data science is about using data to answer specific questions in a scientific way, in a more quantitative way. Why do you say, you've told this to me, why do you say that a lot of your job is being a janitor? Oh, because <laughs> the, you know, there's a lot of data that we're generating and most of these data are unstructured. They're dirty, that's what they call them. So what we do is we clean the data sets, we make sure that they're structured enough so that we can properly analyze them. You came to this via physics, right? Yes. How did, you, how did you end up in data science? When I was doing my dissertation, uh, physics is about the study of nature, study of the different phenomena around us. And usually they look at physical systems. But what I did in my dissertation was look at the dynamics of a social system. Here in UP. Here in UP. Right. So that was the first step to go outside of my field and using the mathematical and statistical tools to understand society. And we did publish a few papers and Singapore took notice. So they tried to invite us there and the rest is history. And when I came to Singapore, most of the problems that we solved involved data almost all, not theoretical, so they would come to us like, Erica, we have this data, can you help solve our problem? And that's, you know, the, the first time I really encountered working with a lot of data sets. We'll talk about those problems in Singapore and here in a bit. How do you, from your point of view, come to AAM? Why are you looking at each other? <laughs> <laughs> because we are so happy about how it all happened. You're checking whether Jikyo will agree with your answer. <laughs> Um, I've always, I told Dikyon that I've always pictured myself going back to the country, but I couldn't find the right timing, you know, because in Singapore, really, I'm, I'm doing quite okay. I'm doing good. More than yeah. okay, actually. <laughs> More I'm than doing okay. I'm good in Singapore, but then I'm like, uh, I really want to go back already because I've been there 5.5 years. And then, I, maybe serendipity, uh, Jikyong um, chatted with me. At, it's all about making an impact for me. It's cliche, it's about making a difference, and you know, it's much sweeter if in doing so, you get to also help your country. So when Jikyo came to me um, to invite me to lead and help build the curriculum for the very first formal graduate program in data science in the Philippines, I mean, how can you say no to that? The uh, sweetness must address this whole scholar ng bayan uh, <laughs> theme that you should have to explain to what scholar ng bayan means. A lot of UP, uh, that, mo, that UP instills in its students, mm. um, national scholars. If you're a UP oh, student, okay. Okay. Um, they instill in you that you're a scholar of the country mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. impliedly should come back and, uh, or should stay or come back and pay it back, I guess. You mean to UP? No, to the, to to the, the country. Philippines. To the oh, Philippines. Okay. Sure, yeah. but, he's, but, he's doing yeah, that yeah. exactly. But my, but my question is, why AAM? Why not UP? Yeah. Why not AIM? <laughs> Why not AIM? Yeah, that's true. Because no, be you started no, working yes, in yes, UP, yes, yes. moved to Singapore. Okay. You know, my background is in physics. To be honest, AIM was never in my radar. I'm from the hard sciences. But then when, when, when I, I got to chat with Jake Kyung, I got to check AIM. And you know what? Data science, if you want to teach it, you don't just teach the technical side. That's what I realized. You have to really teach 
the business aspect of it because its impact is in the businesses, in the enterprises, in governments. So if you have that business aspect, what better, what, what's the best institution to do that? The premier business and management school in the country. Because we don't know, we, they don't only graduate students, but graduate students who have business and management skills. Did you have to sell AIM to Erica? I had to sell a lot of things. Uh, <laughs> some, sometimes I'm a salesperson for AIM, there's no doubt about it. Whenever I had to recruit um, talented people, but honestly, all my life, before I came to AIM, I worked at a large universities, anywhere from, you know, 25, 30,000 to 55, 60,000 students' universities. So having worked at a larger universities, I know how the universities work. Uh, they have to have a structure, they have to have a processes. And sometimes pure size of it, pure structure that that university needs to operate mean that things don't move as quickly as it could move. Um, they don't always have a flexibility to grant uh, exceptions because, because if there are too many exceptions, then there are no rules and it's, it's impossible to um, have some sort of order to it. So, the fact that Erica had a taste of UP, you know, I was kind of pushing the idea that <laughs> come to AIM, you know, we are small, but we are agile, we are private, so we don't have as many restrictions. I give you basically clean blanket. Now you know the stuff, you've been practicing, build the best data science program you can ever imagine. And, and try to educate and, and produce the kind of graduates that you want to hire when you are working in the field. And, um, you know, I'm um, adopted a Filipina, right? <laughs> so I had to make a pitch that you've done enough in the Singapore, that was your <laughs> practice ground, now it's time for it to give back. What has it <laughs> taken so far to build the program that will be launched next year? Yes. Um, so Erica was my first catch, um, and I have uh, since talked to many people who is basically so shocked to learn that AIM has been able to recruit, you know, one of the world's top data scientists. Um, really, jealousy. I think that's what I feel. So but once you get the first one then I think it's easier to recruit the, the, the rest because uh, Erica said after we signed on the dotted line and all that, says, Ji Kyung, you should get my boss. I said, okay, who's your boss? <laughs> <laughs> you, didn't, you, you didn't do your research well enough. <laughs> so, okay, let me talk to your boss. So he signed, that's Chris, he's coming soon, and you've signed two more. Yeah. Building the program itself, Erica, since you're the first one on the ground, what's it taken to design and build it? The, the technical side of it, it's, it's pretty easy, it's pretty standard. But then I really had to reflect on my 5.5 experience in Singapore to inject... 5.5? 5.5 years, oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry, sorry. I thought it was a big data term. No, no, no. no. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, uh, as I was saying, the technical aspect of it was easy because it's straightforward mathematics, statistics, computer science, programming. But then I had to look at my 5.5 years of experience in Singapore. Like, what does it really take to become a data scientist? Like, I would sit in a business meeting with CEOs and CTOs and CFOs, and we don't talk science or math. We talk business and the data that they have and what we can do with their data so that we can help improve their systems. Um, so all these things that I experienced, I injected that in our curriculum. And that's why I said that AIM is really in the best position because we have colleagues here who are very good in policy, governance, business and management. And I could collaborate with them. And that's what I've been doing in building this curriculum. Once it's in place, <clears throat> there are many Philippine problems and issues that data science can help solve. Off the top of anybody's head, transportation, yes. natural disaster. Yes. Give us an example of how data science can help fix some of the problems in transport. Yeah, yeah. I've been thinking about this a lot even when I was still in Singapore, just a thought exercise. Number one, you need the data, right? So we have 
off the top of my head, you have waste data. You can already do that to understand like what, where are the pain points in our the, the bottlenecks in our road networks. Uh, the other more powerful one, which is the holy grail of most data scientists, is mobile phone data. Because with mobile phone data, you know where the people are any time of the day. And with that, you know that where the demand is. So where are people at 7 in the morning? Ortigas, Fairview, I don't know. And Maybe. where do they go? <clears throat> right. So once you know the travel demand, you can plan for services. But services, you know where to build the MRTs, all these things. Because Globe and Smart know where we are 24 hours a day. Yes. The question is just, yeah, whether you can process. access that data yes. and process that data. Yeah, not just mobile phone data, even um, electric consumption. Like in the morning, this barangay, high electric, you know, they're probably sleeping, they're probably there. But when they go to work, suddenly the electricity consumption goes down. That's another proxy. Natural disasters. How can data help there? Um, there's a lot of data about natural disasters. So vulnerability of an area is one. Uh, road network is another one. Population density. So we, in fact, we joined this competition, UN. It's a big ideas competition. And one of our proposition was to use all these data sets to come up with a platform you know, that would suggest where to build evacuation centers that are not vulnerable and could cater to more population. And um, yeah, so, and also planning, like where are you gonna build the warehouses to store, for example, relief goods in case something happens. JK, you, you were, when we talked about this first, you talked about how more and more a CEO's decision will be either data-driven or actually- Automated. Or automated. Some, where are, some where? consultancy outfits are now predicting in two to five years up to 20% of current CEO's jobs will be automated. What does that mean for the executive or the CEO? I think when we were trying to design this data science program, uh, there were several principles that we want to make sure <coughs> that it's going to be implemented. One, we wanted to make sure that our graduates are going to be able to hit the ground running. Because I hear a lot of data science um, consultancy agencies, outfits, they take the computer science graduates and they actually have to send them on a training program before they can actually do the job. Because you know, it, it, there, there's a huge gap between what they learn in the school and what they need to do on the job. So we want to be very practice oriented. Um, so our professors will not be just academics. So Erica and, and Chris are coming back to academia, but not in a traditional sense of academics. They will stay close to the market, constantly uh, solving the problems. So our students will be doing project in every term. Uh, during every term, what they learn in the classroom, they will have a chance to apply. So by the time they graduate, especially with a capstone course, they will have a ready-made portfolio to show that they know how to solve the problem right away. Um, the other thing we want you to do is now, these data scientists we will produce will be actually writing codes, will be actually be working on analysis of data, but we also need to train actually top people. Mm -hmm. If top management CEOs do not know the capability of data science, what data science can do in terms of solving problems or actually creating better impact, then you know at the middle level, at a junior level, they won't be make, able to make a lot of differences. So we actually are planning a higher level top management data science program to be able to present to the companies that these are the things that we can do with the proper data scientists. These are kind of ways that you can structure your problems. So we're actually targeting high level training program, short programs, as well as the uh, master's level courses and also certificate courses, those who cannot afford the whole degree I think program. You use a term <clears throat> or a phrase that people need to learn to speak data mm -hmm. as a language. Yes. So yeah, uh, so one of the ideas is to really spread a data science culture. Aside from the things that um, Ji Kyung has already mentioned, the different courses, uh, we are also involved in some of the government's you know, efforts to educate people about data science. Because 
we want to re-engineer the workforce and to train future data analysts, technicians, programmers. They need to learn about data science more. Many, if not most CEOs, come up through marketing or sales or operations finance, or finance. Mm -hmm. You're saying the day will come when a CEO could have come up through the data sciences track? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Um, I think right now, uh, to be honest with you, Coco, I see a bit of panic in the <laughs> marketplace because every CEO, president, um, chairman know that this is a huge thing. This is something they must get into. Uh, one, they are short of talent, but perhaps more importantly, they don't know exactly what this means for them. How do they need to restructure, reorganize uh, their business so that they are prepared to be able to, to deal with this issue uh, effectively? Um, we don't want to name names, but we have been approached even before we launched the program by almost all top companies in the Philippines. Um, they want to work with us. They are uh, very keen to be able to build a relationship with us so they won't be left behind. Which actually brings us to the what next. You have a data sciences program that Erica and Chris and company are building. You'll get the first students for that next year. But what else will be happening or will be happening in the meantime? Well, this is very, very exciting for us. Um, so with uh, Chris and Erica, we are studying data science lab. And uh, it is going <coughs> to be named Access at AIM. So it, it actually has some implications in terms of we want our talent, skill sets, mindset to be accessible. For sure access has a meaning, right? Right, exactly. It's acronym for Analytics, Computation and Complex Systems Lab Access. And, and so what will this, this will be like a mini A-Star, the, yes. the agency you worked for in yes. Singapore. It's like a model of A-Star where it will be a one-stop shop for uh, practitioners, even um, small and medium enterprises, even startups yes. and big companies to come to us if they want to know more about data science and how we can really use data science simulations and modeling to help their businesses. So we are the practitioners in the field. We're not just the, the academic professors, but here we really do real work. Because I'm not so worried about the big CEOs that you say are in some kind of panic. I'm more concerned about the smaller companies that may not be able to afford the well, I think that's the beauty of it, Coco, because <clears throat> uh, with our master students who will be working on the project throughout their program duration, the lab will also be able to handle different levels of uh, problems and projects with a different um, size of pockets, if you will. So, you know, small companies without a lot of money our students can do a lot of pro bono projects. Yes. You know, obviously under the supervision of uh, our faculty, but you know, they will probably never be able to offer the consultancy fees of the real data scientists, but certainly they can benefit from our students working on their project. So we'll be able to provide a service to all different kinds of stakeholders, and that was actually one of my sales pitch. You can actually help build this <coughs> country. Yeah. Not and, to say I am. Yeah. And then when they find out that data science is actually useful for them, even if they're a small company, then it's easier for them to invest, right, in data science. Okay, Jikyung, Erica, thank you very much. Thank you.